Ever since we published our book, The Mystery of the Menorah, Gary Sterman and I have been finding menorah designs throughout the Bible. Gary has come across a menorah design in the book of Zechariah, two menorahs actually, and they tell the age-old story of the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. Gary Stearman is here to discuss this, what I feel is a fascinating discovery in the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah has 14 chapters and uh, it evenly divides right in the middle. Chapters 1 through 7, chapters 8 through 14, and uh, this gives us two sevens, J.R., and as we have uh, noted in the past, anytime you see seven of anything in the Bible, you've got not just a serial numbering of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but what you actually have is a structure uh, designed around the menorah that used to stand in the old tabernacle, the days of Moses, in the days of Solomon, the first temple, the days of Zerubbabel, the second temple. The menorah stood there in the holy place as the light representing God's spirit at work, but more than that, J.R., it, it tells a little story. It has a special light right in the middle uh, of the seven. So the fourth chapter is actually the, the theme spreading out over to chapter 1 and all the way over to mm -hmm. chapter 7. But it all really begins in chapter 4, doesn't it? That's right. So a, a menorah then gives highest importance to the central uh, light called the servant lamp or uh, in the case of seven events, number 4, which is the exact center of the seven events, always carries the theme or is of central importance. Okay, so we're talking here about themes in Zechariah. And it's fascinating to note that chapter, the theme of chapter 1 is repeated in chapter 7. The theme right. of chapter 2 is repeated in chapter 6. The theme of chapter 3 is repeated in chapter 5. And that which gives all these, um, what, chapters 1, 7, 2, 6, 3, 5, their impetus is chapter 4, mm -hmm. the main theme. And, and uh, let's just immediately go there and discover what's the subject of chapter 4 in Zechariah. And I'm reading in uh, the first verse, and the angel that talked uh, with me came again, waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? So uh, Zechariah is getting ready to receive a vision. And what does he see here in the fourth chapter? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, seven lamps uh, thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top. Uh, uh, upon the top thereof. And J.R., mm -hmm. what we have here is a beautiful golden menorah yes. with a servant lamp, <laughs> with lamps on each side of the servant lamp, and we have an oil supply. Now, you got to admit, that's a really an awful coincidence <laughs> that it's in chapter number four. Yes. <laughs> uh, no coincidences, folks. Stay with us. This is really fascinating. And, you know, one of the most exciting things about this is uh, this, this menorah is God saying in verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So mm -hmm. we're talking about the Holy Spirit here being the light. And, and you know, in our studies of the primeval light, we discuss this, that the Holy Spirit is actually the uh, primeval light um, it it's, would be impossible to separate the two. They, they may yeah. not be exactly the same, but you can't see one without the other. The Holy Spirit is, uh, is seen by human eyes in ages past, of course, not today, as uh, tongues of fire that set upon each of them, or a burning bush that was not consumed, or a pillar of fire above the camp of Israel. And by human eyes, he's represented by the seven lights of the lampstand. It stands in the holy place. And this is fascinating to me, J.R., because we, the seven lights uh, represent the way God works to redeem humanity. In Revelation, we see the seven spirits of God before the throne of God, and those have to be in some way like a menorah. Yeah, well, design. you know, it's the menorah in chapter 1. Absolutely. You know, when Christ is seen standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, well, by the time we get to chapter 4, that seven-lamp menorah is in heaven before the throne of God and is called 
the seven spirits of God. Now let's uh, back up just one notch here and d discover the reason why Zechariah wrote his prophecy. Uh, in 536 BC when Cyrus the Great uh, of Persia gave permission for the captives of the Babylonian captivity to return to the land uh, they came back. In 536 B.C. they actually uh, were in Jerusalem and under Zerubbabel they started to, uh, he was given governorship by Cyrus, mm -hmm. and they started to rebuild Jerusalem. What happened in actuality is the people became much more interested in rebuilding their own houses and after three or four years they just quit work on the temple entirely and they began to focus on building their, their homes which displeased God. And so through the uh, prophet Zechariah, he came along with a message, get busy and start rebuilding my temple. Well, these messages came in 520 and 519 BC. And at that time, the temple began to be rebuilt. And by about uh, 517 or so, it was fully functional again. So this message to Zechariah was to encourage the people. In these first seven chapters that we've been discussing, are a message to Israel, the contemporary of Zechariah. Get busy and build the temple. You know, Gary, Zechariah laid the themes here that are taken up by John in writing the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. We see the same themes here in Zechariah as we do in the book of Revelation. Now, John does a futurist view of it, but Zechariah here lays the foundation for the various themes. Uh, for example, uh, these seven lamps here are really commensurate with the seven lamp menorah that Christ is standing in the middle of mm -hmm. uh, when we look at him in, in chapter 1. And then we see uh, chapter 1, uh, Zion is to be rebuilt. In chapter 7, the Jews are to be scattered. And this, even though it is not Ephesus and Laodicea, it bears the resemblance, bears the yeah. same underlying theme that is used by John when he wrote the seven letters to the seven churches. And here, when God says in chapter 4, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith mm -hmm. the Lord, we are reminded that in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, in the letters to the churches, each one is prefaced by saying, let him that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the that, churches. That's absolutely right. And so the menorah then is the agency of God's Holy Spirit and the lights around the servant, representing uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, the lights around the servant are connected by semicircular arms. Mm -hmm. So that the first and the seventh are connected, the second and the sixth, the third and the fifth are connected, and uh, because of that, you have a, a balanced, symmetrical, prophetic pattern yeah. that always ha carries out the same redemptive theme. Every place you see a seven, the seven uh, the first seven chapters of Zechariah then carry the theme of not by might or not by power, but by my spirit will you go ahead and you will build the temple. And you know what? They did. They actually did at this point go ahead yeah. and build it. Well, you know, the theme of chapter 4 is light. It is. But when we get over to chapter 7 through 14, we have another menorah design. And the theme of chapter 11 is darkness. That's fascinating, Gary. We've yeah. got the struggle here between light and darkness. As a matter of fact, when you turn over to chapter 11, you have maybe one of the darkest chapters in all the Bible. Chapter 11 of Zechariah talks about how Israel would reject her Messiah. Yeah. But not only that, Israel would one day receive a false Messiah whom we know as the Antichrist. Now, that's darkness. Wow. In as, fact, chapter 11, yeah. last verse, read it, Gary. This Here's is the last verse of chapter 11, 11, 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. That's the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So, darkness. Darkened is the last word of the chapter. It is. Uh, to depict the very fact that that servant lamp is usurped by the prince of darkness himself. And you know, as we said in our book, and again, we're talking about the mystery of the menorah and the Hebrew alphabet, the servant lamp 
always typifies this great battle between light and darkness. Of course, we know who's going to win, but it'll be a while yet. Yeah, you know, in the days of Samuel, uh, upon Samson's death, Samuel was just a young man, uh, but we have the snuffing out of the servant lamp. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about the servant lamp going dark. That's right. And uh, then, of course, on uh, on the day of Calvary, when Jesus died, there was darkness from 12 noon till 3 in the afternoon over all the world. And the light of the sun went out. The servant lamp that serves our world went out. So the metaphoric uh, uses that God has to depict this battle between good and evil, light and darkness, is fascinating. And Zechariah does a magnificent job in carrying out these themes. We'll have more to say about it when we return in just a moment. Zechariah has two basic themes. They deal with the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ. Now in the first seven chapters, the major theme, the thrust of it is the first advent of Christ, though there are allusions to the second mm -hmm. advent. In the final seven chapters, the main theme is the second coming of Christ, though there are allusions in it to the first advent. Gary, right. fascinating mm. study here in Zechariah. Yeah, and uh, it's complex, but in a way it's simple because the, uh, the first seven chapters have as their central feature the servant lamp of the menorah, uh, the strengthening of Zerubbabel, the governor of uh, Judea, to... Uh, to build the temple. And J.R., he's strengthened by two witnesses mm -hmm. who, are, who stand, one on each side of the golden lampstand. And they're called two olive trees. That is, they're, mm -hmm. they're spirit-filled. They have this oil yeah. of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's the building of the second temple. And uh, this, of course, is a reference to Zerubbabel's own day, but it also looks forward by typology to the rebuilding of the final temple, the third temple. The two, we know the two witnesses are going to be there as well. Mm. How about that? In chapter 4 of Zechariah, we have the, um, the spirit side of the lamps. And in chapter 4 of Revelation, we go to the throne of God in heaven and see the seven spirits in the form of seven lamps. That's true. In chapter 6, of Zechariah, we have four chariots pulled by horsemen, red, black, white, and grizzled and bay. Mm -hmm. In chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, we have the four horsemen with the same basic colors. Yes. Incredible here. <laughs> well, Zechariah is called the revelation of the Old Testament sometimes by many, and it's because it uses the same themes, uh, and it shows that really that over the ages God applies the same principles to the solving of problems. Mm -hmm. We have the crowning of the high priest as a very, very major theme in the book of Zechariah because the high priest, uh, the office of the high priest, had to be functional mm -hmm. in order uh, to allow the temple to be fully functional. And we, f we find the high priest, he happened to be named Joshua, which is, by the way, the same name as Yeshua, or Jesus. We find him called the branch in uh, Zechariah 6.12. Speak unto him, saying, Thus uh, speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. That's mm -hmm. Joshua, but of course that's looking all the way forward to the great high priest, Jesus. Yes. And when he comes, he will rebuild the temple, the third temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the years leading up to that, we're going to see um, a temple of sorts built, but not the final glorious temple that Christ will build when he returns someday. Now, the very last sentence of the first seven chapters, a grouping of seven, speak of Israel's scattering. The very last sentence of chapter 7 says, But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, and no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. And then chapter 8, verse 1, begins with the Lord returning to Zion. That is to say, 
Here comes the Lord. He, in his strength, he's going to regather and restore the people. And so this second grouping of, eight, uh, of seven chapters in Zechariah then deals with Israel's final restoration. So what we have here in the first seven chapters deals with, uh, shall we say, John, uh, as Jesus said, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, mm -hmm. to Zechariah, God is saying, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are. In chapters 8 through 14, the mm -hmm. things which shall be hereafter. And so we have here, uh, what, A.D. 70, A.D. 132, mm -hmm. uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt after Calvary, <coughs> after the rejection of the yes. Messiah. We have the scattering of the Jews to the nations. That's right. Chapter 8 um, brings us to 1948 and <laughs> the return oh, of the it, Jews. It's a beautiful picture. Yes. And, and it's so clear that, that it's divided into two sevens, each seven topped by a servant lamp, one light and one dark and the reason is because there is still a great darkness ahead for Israel the time of Jacob's trouble that battle's yet to be fought mm -hmm. and we see it fought in chapter 11 which is the central feature of the second group as a matter of fact we uh, chapter 11 starts with fire mm -hmm. open thy doors O Lebanon that the fire may devour thy cedars that's a servant lamp but it is a devouring fire yeah. rather than a spiritual illumination. Isn't that fascinating? That really is, Gary, to have the fire here in the fourth chapter of the second division. Now, this fire consumes the enemies of Israel, but it also uh, wreaks havoc upon Israel itself because they have disobeyed God, they have rejected uh, their true Messiah, and they're about to receive the false Messiah. Mm -hmm. You know, chapter 8, then, in its menorah design, is connected to chapter 14, mm -hmm. as, chap as chapter 1 was connected to chapter 11. Chapter 8, we have Israel and Jerusalem to be restored. In chapter 14, we have the Messiah's second coming to establish the kingdom. That's right. And yeah. so we have the same menorah design in chapters 8 through 14. And J.R., nothing could be clearer to me. Uh, you know, people like to read the Bible to try to foretell the future. Well, in a sense, that's forbidden. We're not really supposed to try to divine the future by reading the Bible. But what the Bible does allow us to do is see how God is going to work. And very clearly from this 11th chapter of Zechariah, which sets the theme of the second uh, uh, set, uh, very clearly, J.R., he's going to uh, allow Israel to receive the false Messiah for the purpose of completing their restoration. It's not a totally lost cause. And then, of course, we have chapter 12, 13, and 14, which leads up to the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. We have chapter 12, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And the big battle then comes when even the feeble among them shall be as David. And we have the Lord touching down in chapter 14, his feet shall stand that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ to put a stop to the battle of Armageddon. And that day, we've got a plague in chapter 14 that uh, destroys the enemy. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That's quite a fire, isn't it, for a menorah design? It's quite a fire, and it, and it is the fire, the holy fire of the Lord. We might call it the purifying fire. Mm -hmm. uh, and for some uh, weeks now, we've been talking about God as, as the true light, the primeval light, in whom there is no darkness at all. But, you know, J.R., he's allowed darkness uh, in order that his remnant could, be, could go through the struggle toward redemption and, and at last come to the true light. And that's exactly what we see here in Zechariah. Yeah. You know, we have, we have speculated that this flesh consuming away and their eyes consume away and their holes or tongues in their mouth to be nuclear war. We don't know that it is nuclear war, but it certainly uh, smacks of the capabilities today of nuclear mm -hmm. warfare. But if you'll recall, God said to Moses, no man can see God and live. 
will in the glorious second coming of Christ in power and great glory it's very possible that this sword that proceeds out of his mouth is the is the emanation of the primeval light mm -hmm. and it just melts the enemy nothing can stand before the light of God and in particular what can't stand is the kingdom of the Antichrist which is absolutely smashed and and we might even call that the main theme of the second, second seven chapters of Zechariah mm -hmm. you know it's also fascinating to me that when he comes they're going to ask him as in chapter 13 verse 6 what are these wounds in thine hands and he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends mm -hmm. dear friend those wounds in his hands were for you Trust him as your Lord and Savior today, and he'll give you eternal life.